Good, good evening. <clears throat> this, I'm calling the uh, Transportation and Public Safety Committee meeting to order. I have one minute after six. We do have quorum. Uh, uh, after we, we'll go through the uh, the general rules, what we do in, in, in this meeting, what we do uh, uh, has been our practice that we allow the public to ask questions during the uh, uh, presentations. Uh, instead of doing the public comment uh, on six, we do it at, when we have the presentations and we will continue that practice. We ask the public to uh, keep their questions short and and and, uh, and or comments short and uh, uh, to the point. Uh, there is a two minute limit, which which hopefully I don't have to enforce. But if I if we need to, I will. Uh, again, I welcome everyone. We'll do a, uh, uh, a John. Why don't you do a roll call? Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair Sid Meyer. Present. And, and board member, uh, committee members, go off mute for a second so we'll get through this quicker and then you go on mute after I call your name. Esther Blount. I didn't see her. John Quinn, secretary here. Ernie Augustus. I didn't see him. Sandy Balboza. Here. Julian Cullen Chung. Here. John Dew. Didn't see him. Cheryl Gelbs. Kate Gilman. Brian Howell. Here. Patrick Kalaki. Here. Nicole Murray. Here. Jonathan Rogers. Here. Zero Scala. Mr. Scala says he is here and having trouble with his microphone. Okay, I saw him. All right. We have we have a quorum. Thank you. Again, good evening, everybody. Good, again, good evening, everybody. Uh, please go back on mute. Except that you're called upon. Uh, I'm going to call on the uh, uh, adoption of the agenda. Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Someone want to make a motion? So move. I'll make a motion. I'd second it. Good by Brian. Hearing no opposition, the agenda is approved. Uh, has everyone had a chance to review the uh, uh, minutes from the previous meeting? If you have any comments or corrections, please submit them. Nicole, I'm calling on Nicole to do the uh, uh, district level crash statistics so we can have a discussion on, on that continuing problem. Good evening, Nicole. Hello, thank you for screen sharing. Okay, let me know when you can see my screen. Spreadsheet. I can see the screen, I can see the spreadsheet. Okay, sorry, let me move my tools here, they're all in the way. Uh, okay, all right. So uh, what is this for new folks? This is a multi-tab spreadsheet with maps and visualizations of district level uh, auto and bicycle collisions uh, in the district with injuries or property damage. Um, this data comes from the NYPD records that are fed into uh, the open data portal under the table, motor vehicle collisions and crashes. It is then fed into Crash Mapper where it can be easily filtered and visualized on a map. Um, this data is as reliable as is reported to the NYPD. Um, it is required to be filled out for collisions where someone is injured or killed or where there's at least uh, $1,000 worth of damage. Some reports may have incomplete or ambiguous information. Um, so for example, some crashes that happen maybe on a border of a community district may but get assigned to the one next to us. So it's just rely, rely, uh, as reliable as the report. Uh, I redo this report every month for the month prior uh, to the meeting. So this will be for April and then for the whole year, um, month to month. Um, we're doing this because we can't all see everything everywhere all at once, uh, but we can get a look uh, at the statistics uh, at a bird's eye view so we can kind of understand what's going on outside of where we go um, every day. So uh, with that being said, um, because this is for April, 
um, and not may. And because this is uh, for CB2, this will not include the death of Adam Uster, um, which happened May, I think first, um, one block outside of our community district. Uh, Adam was traveling from Wegmans, which is in our community district. Um, he was a father of two and he was killed by a truck that did not stop to turn or turn its blinker on. Uh, he was in the bike lane. Um, he died of internal injuries. Uh, there was a horrifying video and two children lost their father because a truck driver did not slow down. Um, it wasn't even a big truck, relatively small truck, um, but he passed from his injuries the same day. Um, and uh, we mourn his loss, um, but that death will not be included in this report or will it be in May because it happened just one block outside of our district. But I wanted to bring that up that th that did happen on um, Lexington and Franklin. So that being said, oops. Um, the blue lines are all crashes with injuries and fatalities. And again, just with injuries and fatalities, this for every crash, the charts, the numbers will be off the charts um, by month. And we were kind of upticking in March, um, last month since January, and we're kind of going back down again, but these are the general trends. And this orange line at the top here, um, this is all of motorist injuries. So motorists actually lead the way in who is injured in these collisions or reports um, a lot of damage, right? We hear a lot about pedestrians and cyclists who are the most vulnerable, but because cars crash into each other more often than not, we're having motorists that are being injured. Um, we are seeing an uptick, this other orange line at the bottom here, this is cyclist injuries are kind of slowly upticking, um, unfortunately, um, but not as much as motorist injuries uh, are, are leading the way. And the yellow line are pedestrian injuries, which are staying kind of relatively flat-ish um, throughout the year. So if we take a look at a map, Link to it really quick. This red dot right here, um, this was a death that we had in April of C Catherine Harris on Atlantic Avenue uh, at about 10 o'clock at night. She was in the crosswalk and had the right of way. Um, I do believe last I heard the driver of the um, sedan yeah. who. Progress. Oh, zero, we're getting a little feedback, thank you. Um, the driver of the um, vehicle that um, killed her has been uh, charged with a manslaughter and a few other things. I believe he was intoxicated or was charged as such, um, but she also uh, passed away um, due to her injuries uh, in April and that happened at Atlantic Avenue. I did see that um, Joanne Simon, her office and some advocates sent a letter to the DOT asking for certain improvements there because this particular intersection has seen quite a lot of deaths. Um, there was a store owner who was killed a few years ago and a few years before that, or maybe right after that, there was somebody else, but just right along this area um, on uh, Atlantic Avenue, um, quite a dangerous stretch of road. It's quite wide um, and it just invites speeding. Um, so I don't know if we have a copy of that letter, um, but um, her office did send a report, uh, a request to DOT for very specific upgrades, um, some raised crosswalks and certain lighting and lighting and so on and so forth. Um, I will say that Adam, uh, who was again in a bike lane that was just painted, there's no protection. There was a small sort of bump out on the road that's meant to slow down cars as they turn. The truck drove right over it. it the bump out is like an inch high, drove right over it, was offered no protection whatsoever. So really, when we talk about protection, these things need to be real and hardened. They cannot just be paint and tiny little marks on the road because some drivers, whether they're intoxicated, um, like the person who killed Catherine was, or whether they're just in a hurry, like this truck driver was, if it's not something that's going to stop people from whether they make a mistake or whether they do it intentionally or are negligent, this is what kind of protection people need, real physical protection, real barriers. Um, and then again, we're just seeing our usual suspects on Flatbush and Myrtle Avenue uh, for injuries. So we had 19 cyclist injuries, 14 pedestrian injuries, and 43 motorist injuries, and one pedestrian fatality, and that is Catherine Harris. And we'll take questions. One of the reasons why I support separate bike lanes that are protected bike lanes for, bi for bicyclists. Absolutely. In any case, any questions for Nicole? I'm sorry to hear about I the other a question, if, if that's okay. Yeah, put your hand up so we can see who, who that is. Uh, sorry. On, on, the, on the toolbar, it says reactions. And in reactions, 
One of the three actions is raise hand. Kate, uh, Kate yes. Handler, what, what, what's your question? Gotcha, yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, I saw there was also a point at the intersection of, I believe it was like uh, Navy sort of Ashland, that intersection and Myrtle, I think yes. I was, I think I might have missed this. Is were those um, pedestrian bicyclists? Were these also motorist injuries? I wasn't sure if they were color coded in some way. Uh, they're not color coded by the the uh, vehicle. They're color coded by um, whether it was injury or fatality. So that was two motorists injured and one cyclist injured. At this level of detail, I don't have whether or not that was one crash or if it was a few. Um, the the open data portal will have that. Um, but this does show that at that exact intersection, there are at least three injuries, two motorists and one cyclist. And that's that, April or the last year? So and, that's April. That, and that street is scheduled for upgrade. That, the Ashland, the, are you talking about the bike lane? Yes, right. The okay. whole area is scheduled for uh, changes and upgrades, uh, which will happen, which DOT reported will take place this summer. Great news. All right, thanks so much. I appreciate the answers. Any other questions? Andrew, this is John, uh, Sid, I'm sorry, this is John, John how are you? Good, 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 good. Uh, unfortunately, I had to call in because my Zoom link didn't work. Um, in reference to the installation of bike lanes, bike lanes are installed throughout the city of New York. I think there are 300 miles of them or, or some uh, insane amount that actually removes space from streets that were designed for cars. Is there an overall study of the installation of bike lanes being done by DOT in a city that was not designed for bike lanes? Well, you can ask DOT. I don't know. I don't know. The answer is, is that, that when they install a bike lane, they do a study. And when they do, I know they do a study of that particular street, but it has much larger implications. And we continue to have to deal with bicycle accidents and deaths and and mode. There's no study of how to control alcoholism so that folks don't drive while drunk. And as long as we allow that to happen, we're going to have accidents. So how we go and plan against something that does not deal with the cause of the problem is sort of putting the cart before the horse. Well, so in it, any case, John, you know, we stopped calling them accidents a while back. It's now called traffic violence, number one. Number two, that the city has been on a uh, adding bike lanes for a number of years, and the studies, year-to-year -year studies, have for the most part shown that where there are bike lanes installed, the accident rates have been going down. Now, in any case, you're, I'm happy for you to bring to us uh, these issues for DOT to study. You can do that in the uh, other committee business. Uh, what we're gonna go on to now is the presentation on the Livingston Street Transit Priority Study. Okay, I can take that. Chris, 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 Chris. Uh, yeah. Chris. Yes, uh, it's great to be back here at Community Board 2 Transportation Committee. And it's good to Sun returns. With a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. Um, just for those new faces, <clears throat> um, I served in the Brooklyn Borough Commissioner's Office, focusing on downtown Brooklyn. Um, for about eight years. And uh, right now I am the director of transit planning and policy. So I work on bus priority projects throughout the city. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that uh, I, we have some colleagues with us today um, from the borough commissioner's office. You all know Emily. Um, also, I'll introduce in a moment, Tyler Peter, who's the project manager for the Livingston Street uh, bus priority project. Um, and also, this is a joint project in many ways with MTA. We've been working for for, for a while with them co collaboratively on this corridor. So I want to recognize that we have uh, at least three, I saw three at least, 
uh, members from the MTA staff here, including Mike Nelson, uh, Ryan Hall, and Luke De Palma. And I believe Ryan is going to, as part of the presentation, cover some of the MTA data. Um, just, I guess, I'll be quick here because uh, Tyler's really going to give a comprehensive presentation. Um, but I'll just note that some of you, I think, were on the committee when we when we implemented the current version of our J Street bus lanes. Um, that was probably close to 15 years ago. Um, and that was actually proved to be very effective at the beginning, but over time, uh, effectiveness has declined with things like double parking, um, regular uh, building uh, development that's impacted the bus lane, particularly on the north side, um, and other factors. So recently, in the past few years, MTA and DOT have begun taking a fresh look at it, and we've agreed that there's a need for something more robust, a more robust approach, if we're really going to make buses, uh, make all the bus lanes that converge upon Livingston Street move um, effectively uh, throughout this corridor and serve the passengers that are on those buses. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tyler, who has a presentation which will um, walk you through what we're proposing on Livingston Street. Thanks, Chris. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Everyone can see the screen now? Yes. Perfect. So, so for our agenda this evening, we're going to discuss some background on the study area and why we're looking at Livingston Street. Then we'll discuss the proposed project, and then we'll end by looking at the next steps in the project's development. So the study corridor, the project study corridor runs along Livingston Street between Borum Place to Flatbush Avenue. The corridor is relatively consistent in width. It's about 50 feet from curb to curb. The study area is also within a Vision Zero priority zone. Livingston Street was identified as a bus priority corridor in both New York City DOT's streets plan and the MTA's Brooklyn Bus Network redesign. Additionally, the current bus lanes are constantly blocked by parked vehicles, as Chris had noted, especially in the westbound direction, slowing down uh, all vehicles, not just buses. Now to go into the existing conditions, I'm going to pass it over to our partners at the MTA to discuss bus ridership and speeds. Tyler, yes, thank you for that background. Uh, my name, again, is Ryan Hall. I am one of the bus priority planners here at the MTA. Um, and the Livingston Street Corridor is of particular interest to us, uh, mainly because of its history of both heavy usage and slow bus speeds. And as you can see on this slide, buses on Livingston move approximately 50,000 people per day. And um, this is a very large volume of passengers, um, equates to about 30 buses per hour in each direction during peak times. And while these are very high numbers, riders are consistently facing slow and unreliable service along Livingston, mainly due to congestion and double parking issues. As you can see from the data in this chart, the average bus speed across the Livingston corridor hovers just above five miles per hour and dips as low as uh, just under four miles per hour during peak hours. Both of those speed results are well below the borough average. And they, re they indicate that the current bus lanes on Livingston are simply not working. When we have low speeds like this, bus customers spend a lot more time in traffic, creating longer travel times when what folks really want is just an efficient, quick way to get to where they need to go. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Tyler. Thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Continuing to traffic on Livingston, we can see from our data collected back in October that westbound, which is shown in the light blue, are consistently higher vehicle volumes compared to the eastbound. Um, sometimes 250 additional vehicles in the case of weekdays between 8 and 9 a.m. When we look at crash history, we can see that the quarter has had a number of seriously injured pedestrians, most occurring at Flatbush Avenue and Livingston. 
With this in mind, our proposal is going to include a number of pedestrian safety improvements throughout the corridor and especially at Flatbush Avenues. Livingston's, as all of you know, is a mixed use corridor with a number of high rises, number, numerous retailers, and that creates a demand for deliveries. From our surveys, we see that a majority of deliveries occur before 5 a.m., predominantly in the morning hours. The blocks with the most deliveries are near Dallas Barbecue at Gallatin Place and Cookies over at Hanover Place. Our proposal will look at curb regulations to accommodate this demand for deliveries. So the proposed project intent is kind of based on the goals that was discussed in our community advisory board meeting back in December. The goals that included improved bus reliability, increased pedestrian safety, and discourage illegal parking. The first thing you'll notice in our proposed conditions at the bottom is that we're having both bus lanes along the south curb and then a separate one-way westbound lane for general traffic with a curbside parking lane. When we look over at Flatbush Avenue, we can see we have painted pedestrian space on both the north and south curb with a new pedestrian island between the two directions of travel. We're also proposing to ban the left, uh, the right turn from southbound Flatbush to Livingston. Nevin Street is southbound and is just a block before on Flatbush, so vehicles can easily make a right onto Nevins and a right onto Livingston that way. We would also design the pedestrian uh, zone on the north curb to still allow emergency access from any uh, direction of travel for emergency vehicles. Continuing to Nevin Street, you'll notice that there's a bus boarding island in the middle of the street. So this is a concrete island that it's being proposed. At Hanover Place, we have a painted pedestrian uh, curb extension on the northwest curb that we're proposing. And at Bond Street, we're proposing two painted pedestrian extensions, both at the northeast corner and the southwest corner. There's also a proposal to remove the bus stop at Bond Street, which is just in the westbound direction. This is in line with the MTA's Brooklyn Bus Network redesign, which was released back in December 1st of 22, uh, 2022. Continuing down the corridor at Elm Place, we're proposing both a painted curb extension on the northwest corner and a pedestrian island on the east crosswalk. You can see we're continuing that two bus lanes on the south curb design up until we get to just after Hoyt Street. At Hoyt Street, we have the last bus boarding island before we convert um, the westbound bus lane into an offset bus lane. We do this because we're allowing two-way traffic between Borum Place and Gallatin Place. This allows vehicles who are trying to access the Metro Tech area north of Fulton Mall, another entry point. At Gallatin Place, we also have a painted curb extension on the northwest and the northeast corner. And then we have no uh, new proposals west of Smith Street on Livingston. This is due to the construction that's currently and has been ongoing at the MTA office building that's located uh, on the southwest corner and takes up kind of the curb space that's currently on the south curb of Livingston there. To talk about a little bit of the traffic accommodations, you might have noticed that Hoyt and Nevins were proposing a left turn bay. This would be a separate phase from um, the through vehicles going westbound and the buses that are going east and westbound on the south side of the street. The left turn vehicles, we get a red light. And then when the bus lanes receive a red light, that left turn bay would get a green light. And obviously the, the third phase for the intersection would be both um, the east and westbound traffic for all vehicles would be given a red light while Hoyt and Nevin Street, uh, respectively, would get a green lane. Continuing, we do have a proposal for Skimmerhorn between Borum Place and Smith Street. 
we would propose to change the direction of travel. Right now it is uh, one lane westbound. We're proposing to make it eastbound. This is consistent with um, previous projects that occurred on Skimmerhorn Street last fall, which changed um, Skimmerhorn between Smith Street and Flatbush to eastbound. This allows vehicles that are currently traveling between Borum Place and Flatbush eastbound another route since uh, they would not be able to use uh, Livingston Street in this proposal. So to get a little bit high level on how some of those traffic might reroute. So to show again, if, if vehicles are coming southbound on Borum Place, if they're looking to go to Gallatin Place, they still will have the ability to do so. And if they're looking to continue further east, um, they would either be able to take Skimmerhorn Street or Atlantic Street. Those are obviously the two closest alternatives, um, but with any grid network, obviously there are a multitude other alternatives that vehicles may take as well. So what to expect uh, in our proposed conditions for traffic? We anticipate the proposed street kit changes uh, will cause congestion during implementation, especially as drivers are getting used to the proposed conditions. Our initial outcome of traffic mod the modeling shows that the travel times do increase on eastbound Atlantic and Skimmerhorn Street. The model also points us to three main traffic hotspots in the proposed condition, and that's at Orem Place in Livingston. Hoyt Street and Skimmerhorn and Nevin Street and Skimmerhorn. We're continuing to review our models to understand what potential improvements could be made to reduce the congestion at these hotspots. We're also intending to monitor these intersections as the project is implemented to continue to evaluate their performance over time and make adjustments accordingly. As noted before, travel times, uh, travel patterns are quite dynamic and it's likely that in the proposed conditions, vehicles may choose to travel on different routes entirely um, outside of this um, portion of downtown Brooklyn. There's also, um, so for an example of that might be vehicles might um, turn from Boron Place onto Tillery and go to Flatbush Avenue that way instead of cutting through Livingston Street, Skimmerhorn and Atlantic as they do today. Drivers may also choose to travel different modes um, due to the increase in bus speeds and reliability. They may also choose to travel at different times to maybe avoid the most congested parts of the day. Just to go back over some of the pedestrian realm improvements that were noted earlier. We proposed two concrete bus boarding islands at Nevin Street and Hoyt Street, and two concrete pedestrian islands, and that would be at Flatbush Avenue and Elm Street. These islands provide shortened crosswalks and add a level protection for passing vehicles. And we proposed painted curb extensions at Livingston Street at Flatbush Avenue, Hanover Place, Bond Street, Elm Place, and Gallatin Place. These also reduce crosswalk lengths and adds more space for pedestrians along the corridor. It also creates an opportunity to work with local partners to create artwork in these spaces as seen in a number of painted pedestrian spaces in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, we've been coordinating with the Parks Department as well and different utility companies that serve this area to find feasible locations for new tree pits, especially along the north curb, um, specifically locations where there previously were bus stops. So whether that's the Bond Street uh, location, Hoyt Street, uh, there's a number of potential opportunity locations along the corridor to add some uh, plantings. There's also opportunities to provide standalone planters to improve the public realm in coordination with local uh, maintenance partners as well. Now let's discuss some of the curb regulations and median treatments. We understand the need for curb space for the numerous businesses and residents along the corridor and want to be sure that we're balancing the needs for deliveries as well as demand for parking. We're considering using metered commercial vehicle regulations versus unmetered loading zones that are here uh, that exist today along the corridor. 
we've seen that this type of regulation sees less illegal or unintended use of the loading area. And we also had success in implementing this in similar dense neighborhoods like Flushing as part of our Main Street Busway project. We're also considering daytime metered parking with overnight and Sunday non-metered parking, which exists today on the corridor. This project also looks to implement median treatments to create a physical and visual separation between the bus lanes and the general travel lanes. One example over to the right is we've installed on EL Grant Highway in the Bronx. It's a form of like a precast concrete block that we're able to install to delineate the space. We could install this between our bus lanes on the south curb and some of that channelized or painted space uh, between the westbound travel, general travel lanes. Additionally, uh, we understand that changes to regulations alone will not dramatically discourage placard abuse, double parking, and or illegal parking. Thus, we're proposing enforcement via DOT cameras along the bus lanes and urging our MTA partners to implement cameras on their buses that use the corridor. Additionally, we're working with NYPD to assist with all other enforcement measures. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. I, I asked the question uh, with, at the other meeting we had, but I'll ask it again. There's no mm -hmm. bike lanes planned for uh, uh, Livingston? That's correct. Yes, with the two-way bikeway facility on Skimmerhorn, uh, we're not proposing any bike lanes. Have, have you ever considered allowing bikes to use the bus, the exclusive bus lanes? Um, Chris, do you know if we've ever... Uh, generally, that. generally, we try to avoid it. Um, I know it's a practice in some cities. Um, wherever we can, we try to uh, encourage uh, or try to accommodate cyclists on a parallel road, or if the road is wide enough, in a separate facility, uh, just for safety purposes. It doesn't mean that bikes won't sometimes use our bus lanes, but uh, it's not something we, we look to necessarily encourage. Yeah, you know, we, we have a continuing problem, not only with bikes, but but with uh, the scooters, uh, especially on these streets who are making deliveries, who uh, use the sidewalks, unfortunately. And, and it's something that I'm generally concerned about. Sandy, you have a question? You have to come off mute, Sandy. Sandy, you got to come off mute. Sandy, I'm going to go to Juliet. Oh, no, I know, I know. Wait a minute. Okay. Um, I can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Well, um, I just, you know, we had um a woman who was killed on Atlantic Avenue, and we need improvements there. And every time DOT does something, uh, it diverts. You, you're diverting traffic to Atlantic Avenue. Now you're switching, um, you diverted the westbound lane to Atlantic. Now you're gonna divert the eastbound lane on, on um, whatever street. Uh, you, you threw out a lot of streets, so I'm trying to follow this. But We're talking the, about the, point, the point is that traffic gets, now since they made Skirmahorn Street one way, which which way? Eastbound? Westbound. Eastbound. Now they're changing it to westbound. I don't know. So there's going to be traffic now on Atlantic being diverted going towards Flatbush. I can tell you that when you diverted the traffic um, from Skirmahorn to Atlantic, the uh, the the traffic backs up for many hours longer than it used to. And now it's going to happen, I think, unless I have my directions wrong, eastbound going on Atlantic towards Flatbush. I mean, that's going to be a big mess. I, I, just, I just see that every time DOT tries to improve something on one street, um, particularly, especially Atlantic Avenue, becomes worse and more dangerous and more polluted. Um, so I, I, just, I just think when DOT does something, they're not looking, they're looking to fix one, one problem, but 
they're not, they're making everything else worse. Okay. Julia. Do they want to respond to that? Julia. I, I want to piggyback on what Sandy says. Um, and I think it would be great to get a um, consolidated neighborhood plan for uh, this area. Um, Skirmerhorn was only recently changed to one way single lane eastbound. And then, um, and and traffic has increased both on Atlantic and Skirmerhorn. Traffic backs up very, there are long wait times on both streets eastbound. Um, I'd like to understand um, if DOT has um, the data to explain the hotspots at Nevins and Skirmerhorn and Hoyt and Skirmerhorn. What does that mean in terms of the amount of time people will have to be um, in their cars um, longer from now to the proposed situation? And then secondly, can you are uh, can you come can you look at this with Atlantic in mind and also um, is there any way that we can really be considering both proposals together, whatever mitigation you're going to be doing on Atlantic, um, as well as here. And then the third thing was looking at this a little bit more closely, I noticed that on Livingston, um, not only are we taking away uh, one way eastbound traffic, we're also removing a parking, uh, a parking lane on the south side of the street and not relocating it north of the bus lanes. So we're removing um, two lanes of traffic and it looked uh, uh, of parking and traffic and it looks like we're replacing it with a striped area i'm wondering if we can if that is totally necessary or if we can reconsider the eastbound uh lane um to retain that in the in the uh, proposal chris you want to re respond to both questions at the same time yeah i think there were three questions so maybe starting with the first questions about impacts or uh yeah more specific on travel time impacts or effects um as a result of this project i'll turn it over to tyler to talk a little bit more about that uh i guess one thing i i do want to say is that um you know we are let's be clear we're looking at creating bus bus priority in the case of skimmerhorn bike priority and we're, we've been spending a lot of time studying the potential traffic impacts. We'll continue to study them in terms of a model. We'll continue to monitor them in real life as we implement. But at the end of the day, um, you know, there will, we're not saying there won't be any effects at all. If, you know, in order to create this higher quality bus facility, we're going to need to have, um, you know, there will be some impacts, but I'll, I'll uh, effects, but I'll turn it over to Tyler to talk specifically about travel times and, and what we're projecting at this point. Yeah, I'll just bring back this map to help give people a, a sense. Um, so looking at travel times for vehicles uh, going westbound uh, on Livingston Street are likely to actually increase, um, right, because we're reducing some of the conflicting maneuvers that eastbound traffic creates today. Uh, so we anticipate that traffic going westbound on Livingston uh, will likely actually improve. Uh, when it comes to eastbound traffic, if we look at travel times between, say, Borum Place, as, yeah, Borum Place and Drolliman and Atlantic and Flatbush, uh, if you take Atlantic Avenue the in the morning, that likely is going to be maybe an additional minute at most is what our model is projecting. And then in the afternoon, uh, about two minutes additional uh, travel time between Borum Place and Drolliman and Atlantic and Flatbush. If you were to take Skimmerhorn instead, uh, right now our model is showing maybe 30 seconds additional in the morning. And then in the afternoon, something like three and a half minutes is anticipated. And Skimmerhorn has a, a unique um, traffic issue. Um, I say it's unique because it's relatively low volumes. Right now, it might have 100, 200 vehicles in a peak period, which is very, very low compared to, say, Atlantic Avenue, Born Place, or Flatbush, which have well over 1,000 vehicles in that same hour. 
Um, the problem is that because of these short north-south blocks, most of the timing on the signals is given to those north-south blocks so that the queues don't get backed up over multiple intersections. So the, the timing is not really given to Skimmerhorn, even though it is such a low volume, it does get backed up because it's not prioritized in the grid network. Um, so it's a, it's a unique issue for this type of block, um, but it happens throughout some of our grid system. Um, and then to quickly, to quickly address the other question, because I know other people have their hands up. Mm -hmm. uh, you asked about mitigations on Atlantic. Um, based on our traffic modeling, we think Atlantic can ha handle the additional traffic. However, um, like I mentioned, um, we're going to be monitoring um, not just Livingston, but Skimmerhorn and Atlantic as we implement the project. And if there's a need for uh, improvements or adjustments to Atlantic, We'll certainly uh, consider those. And then also, Julia, in terms of the question about uh, could we some uh, could we somehow allocate space so we, I guess, end up with not losing two lanes of parking? I mean, the only way we could have done that would be to have somehow have parking like in the under this proposal would be to have like parking in the median somehow, but we we just don't we we couldn't find a, a way to sort of make that safe so it wasn't something we're able to do and in portions of it aren't even wide enough for for the park for for a parked car so yeah we did look at how could we maximize parking um but that 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 wasn't something we were able to do yeah, and to say a little bit more on that, um, as you know, today the parking lane is on the south curb of Livingston. The north curb has parking uh, overnight and during the weekend, but during the weekday it is supposed to be a bus lane, um, but we know that it instead winds up being used as placard or door illegal parking. Um, so that that is not supposed to be a parking lane today, um, but it is used as such. Just for the record, I wasn't proposing additional parking. I was uh, proposing the retaining eastbound lane. And so Understood. could you go further with that? If the median, the striped median was wide enough to accommodate the eastbound lane. Mm, okay. Nicole? Uh, yeah, I was curious about a couple of things. One, the traffic hotspots, they seem to be sort of congested around the subway stations. If I'm not mistaken, um, I'm wondering what impacts that will have on people coming in and out of the station there. Um, and then that doesn't seem to map. I, I, I didn't quite remember what um, sort of like pedestrian islands uh, you had mapped out and like what, what decisions were made between making it like the full concrete versus just like paint or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious about like uh, what's being done around these traffic hotspots that are right by the subway station. Um, and then in terms of the loading, um, yes, I'm shocked about Dallas barbecue, but uh, what specifically is going on for any loading zones um, in this area? And I guess the last thing is like, I'm not sure what the latest is on the Shermerhorn bike lane. Has that, is that in progress or implemented or still to come? It was implemented last fall. It was implemented last fall. Okay. So this will be then just redirecting traffic with that bike lane there. Is that correct? Like no changes to the, like nothing else is changing with the bike lane. Correct. Okay. Um, Atlantic is much, much more dangerous than Shermerhorn. I don't know about the change since the bike lane was implemented. I'd be curious as to any, if there is like a nice safe bike route there, diverting as much of this traffic as possible along Shermerhorn, if that's safer, um, because Atlantic is quite dangerous, but if there is adequate protection for um, pedestrian and cyclists on Shermerhorn, like what can you do to, if it's more, you know, you know, equitable to intentionally divert some traffic to Shermerhorn specifically and not Atlantic? Um, I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but maybe something to look into. Thank you. So for uh, the hotspots, some of the, the easiest changes we can do is to signal timing. Um, so that doesn't typically uh, impact the crosswalk times too much. Uh, it's usually a few seconds here or there. 
um, nothing dramatically noticeable uh, to the typical user. But it does over time and you know over a full hour process more vehicles. Um, and so we were looking at signal timing adjustments with our traffic engineers uh, to improve the functionality of the intersections. Um, and as you kind of alluded to, yes, there's um, kind of correlation with the uh, subway entrances as well. Um, and as uh, kind of noted earlier, that it, it has a, a bit to do with the how the vehicles are processed at the intersection, right? If someone's in the crosswalk, a turning vehicle, um, has to wait until the, that person is outside of the crosswalk to turn, um, which uh, if it's one lane of traffic, which it is on Skimmerhorn Street, can um, cause the vehicles to back up a bit and not be able to process through the intersection. Um, so it caused a bit of uh, delay there, um, but that's, you know, delay we see today. Um, and it'll just, you know, with the additional vehicles on Skimmerhorn Street, um, the, de the delay obviously increases as noted by the, the time differential before. Just to, um, add, just to add to that, Tyler, if I, I may have misinterpreted, but I think you were concerned about pedestrian safety as well. Yeah. Um, so I would say that Skimmerhorn, oh, as part of the bike lane project, a lot of a lot of pedestrian safety, you know, uh, uh, elements were put into place. So, like where, um, like for instance, uh, on Hoyt, um, there's a large like pedestrian island in between the bike lane mm -hmm. and the through lane. So, I think it's it's well set up to be uh, to be safe from a pedestrian standpoint but again we'll continue to monitor it and if we see issues um, we can definitely uh, tweak what we have out there thank you and then my last thing was about the loading any loading zones or anything like that yep so for um the north curb the proposal is to have loading zones at least for the morning um in some areas close to you know dallas barbecue and cookies it's likely going to be a like a seven to seven type of regulation so it gives them more time with their uh, more intense usage of deliveries and so that would be predominantly on the north curb as um, metered loading zones yeah i'm going to um, be Call, I'm going to be calling uh, uh, committee members first. I will get back to the public members later, but I'm going to go to Brian How Howell's that now. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> actually, that, that leads right into my next question. I didn't quite catch the answer there. Uh, the current bus lanes, um, I'm sorry, and, and thank you for this proposal. Um, we've been, I think, looking forward uh, to uh, hearing about an upgrade uh, for the, the bus lanes on Livingston. Um, since uh, <clears throat> since 2019, when the Better Buses Action Plan came out, which I've linked in the chat, um, the the hours of the busway currently eastbound, I believe, are seven to seven, and or sorry, eastbound is all day, um, and westbound is seven to seven. Um, are those hours changing for the for the bus lanes busway? Yes. So with this proposal, all lanes would be 24/7. Okay, thank you. Um, and then next question. Um, I see that you're going to be using some form of concrete barriers. I think you showed a picture on um, Edward L. Grant Highway in the Bronx. Are those barriers going to be delineating the entirety of the busway portion lanes or just some portion of it? In particular, I asked about the block of Livingston between Smith Street and Borum Place, which is not just filled with placard abuse, but drivers who place TA vest on the dash. I'm mm -hmm. just hoping to would get the same treatment. Yeah, I, I'll note that um, the project uh, is mostly doing implementation east of Smith Street. Um, it's because uh, with the south curve, there's a lot of construction activity that's happening at the MT office building. Um, but we are looking to look at the western half, kind of west of Hoyt, again, once we have that construction no longer in our curb lane. Um, to potentially uh, look at extending the two-way bus lane treatment further down the corridor, um, but that it's a it's a future project, not proposed um, this year, just due to the construction issues we have um, or the conflicts we have, and so the the precast concrete blocks are going to be mostly in this channelized um, median, so this painted space that you see in the middle of the street. 
um, separating and both physically and visually uh, to the traffic heading westbound and the buses uh, so that there's no conflicts crossing okay, those lanes. You. I'm sorry, and sorry, the, the slide itself says West of Smith Street won't happen until the, the Livingston Street building construction wraps up, but were you saying that the busways between Smith and Hoyt are also going to happen after 2023 or just the concrete blocks portion? Um, so the kind of we're looking at like a second phase to this project once the construction wraps up and we would likely start um, that second phase looking at Hoyt West uh, to Borum. Thank you. John Clint. Thanks, Sid. Uh, two questions. How long are the bus islands going to be? Will there be enough room for multiple buses to pull in? Uh, they, didn't, they can't pull in. I mean, to be loading simultaneously? Yes. So uh, the bus boarding islands are uh, designed to accommodate two full length buses. Um, you can't really see it exactly on this since <laughs> this presentation, um, but yes, they can accommodate two vehicles to be loading and unloading at the same time. And how many how many different bus routes run down Livingston? Ryan can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe right now it's four, um, with about thirty vehicles at least in each peak hour. The B forty one, B forty one Limited, the B sixty seven, the B forty five, and the B one hundred three. So four local, one limited. So, okay, and, and another question on different question, the placard parking, they're not, they're like rats, they're not going away. So how you're just pushing them somewhere else and, and um, what's the plan for enforcement and to curb the placard abuse because they're not, you know, without, without that, they're just going to wind up on somebody on another street that's just going to create more double parking or more uh, lack of access for people who really need curb access. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one this design is meant like this design is meant to make it very difficult for people to park in the bus lanes illegally. It's just like it's counterintuitive. You'd have to go sort of against traffic if you're heading if you're if you're heading in the right direction in traffic and then you want to pull over to the side you'd be like facing oncoming buses so we think that portion will be somewhat self-enforcing in terms of the rest of the street um you know obviously we're going to be working with PD I understand when it comes to placard parking that's an issue um that being said, uh, we are looking at, uh, th there has been legislation that gets passed, that, that has been passed, or I believe will be soon passed, that allows the bus cameras on, uh, on MTA buses to actually include infractions uh, out, outside of just, um, just bus lanes. So we'll include vehicles parking in uh, bus stops in bike lanes and double parking. Um, and, you know, that's automated. So, you know, if you're doing something illegal, if the, the camera doesn't recognize if you have a placard or not. Um, so we're hoping that could have some, uh, could have some impact in terms of uh, corridors in downtown Brooklyn that have buses on them as, 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 they, as this gets implemented in the future. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Katya? We can hear you, Sandy. Oh, Hi. you can. I, I, I should go? Okay. No, no, Katya. Um, hi, I'm Katya. Uh, I had a question, which was, I understand that this will probably slow down conditions, as you mentioned, a minute, two minutes here or there for drivers. But I was wondering if there was any information so it's kind of like Nicole's question, which she put in the chat, which is like, is there a way to quantify, you said there's 50,000 bus riders through this corridor, I think every day or something like that. How many drivers are there through this corridor? And then like, is there a way to compare like the 50,000 people in the bus and how much 
an extra three minutes gets them versus, you know, I assume there's a lot less cars moving through this corridor in that time, just because they take up so much more space than a person on a bus. And like, to help us kind of articulate how many more people and how much more time will be saved as opposed to like prioritizing like an eastbound traffic lane or not having a bus lane or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we, um, between the two slides, I think it showcases the, the different numbers of between the number of buses and then the, the number of vehicles that we have. And obviously it fluctuates depend on time of day. Um, eastbound is much uh, lower than the westbound. And in the morning, uh, there's a lot more vehicles in the morning than there are, say, in the evening. So the, as noted, kind of the, the eastbound vehicles um, in the morning um, are probably getting between, you know, 30 seconds to a minute longer. That's, you know, times by 285. And then what's well, about 400 vehicles in the afternoon getting between another two and a half to three and a half minutes, so. Right, and then it seems like from Brian, as he posted, there are 63,000 bus riders a day, um, maybe a bit lower. So we're talking about improving the speeds for let's call it 50,000 bus riders a day, and mm -hmm. then making perhaps slowing down the commutes of about 400 vehicles, six to 400 vehicles, is that right? Uh, for the peak hour and the vehicles when it slows down that much we'll try to try to find alternate ways right exactly. yeah which also takes time obviously diverting to atlantic takes time but we're talking about mm -hmm. fifty thousand people versus maybe 600 okay thank you i appreciate well that. just to be clear the the 600 number is a peak is an hourly number whereas the, yeah whereas the fifty thousand number is daily it's the daily and it's the total route number so Okay. We, have it, we haven't we could we could do that calculation but we would, i don't want to say any i don't want to without sort of doing the calculation and the numbers exactly i don't want to say anything on the record that's misleading that totally makes sense i see so the the 600 number is per hour and the 63,000 is on livingston street but yeah okay thank you we this is the second round we've got two two people left for second round and then then i'm going to close the uh, questioning so the first one is Sandy. Go ahead, Sandy. Um, am I muted? Can you hear me? No, we can hear you. Oh, okay. So um, a couple of things. Atlantic Avenue is, a, is also a vision zero priority corridor. We get everything diverted, as I said before. Um, the We were told when Skirmahorn, I, I thought they should try to redo the Skirmahorn redesign and, and they were dug their heels in the ground about removing the westbound traffic and making it only eastbound. And now, now it's gonna reverse. So, um, and create, I think, bigger problems uh, because it's heading towards Flatbush because we can see the congestion now um going westbound on atlantic it's it's definitely impacted by that traffic um the other the other thing um you know you mentioned high rise uh, buildings get more deliveries and it's also businesses so i was on a bus um uh, two weeks ago and and the deliveries were not in the bus lane they were in the in the driving lane and the bus couldn't get around, but now you want to have the dedicated bus lane where I put there was one there. But the deliveries, if they're not in the bus lane, they still have to walk the hand trucks and all the boxes and everything pass into the bus lane. They have to get over to the sidewalk somehow. Um, DOT refuses to look at, at these parallel corridors um, uh, comprehensively. That's a problem. And we have um, several, at least four board members um, saying that Atlantic Avenue is more dangerous um, now and definitely more dangerous than Skirmahorn Street. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to represent Atlantic Avenue. Um, I know I know Chris for many years, we had the four to seven parking restriction, which really hurt us 
for 18 years. We tried to stop it. And then, and then one day they said, okay, we're not going to do it anymore. So, I mean, everything seems a little bit, you know, like, I'm going to say arbitrary, but not thought out, not looking at the, as I said before, the impacts you, you're trying to fix one thing. I'm, I, I know Brian is happy about the buses. I take buses occasionally myself and it'd be nice to move them faster, but um, it can't just be one thing at the expense of everything else. It, it needs to work together. And, and DOT doesn't seem to know how to do that. Um, the, the um, what do you call it? The, the Permit talk let's, let's, well, Okay, okay, okay. I knew you were going to stop me. Okay. Fine. No, no. You made you made the point that Atlantic Avenue is not being studied. I may have something to respond to it. Yeah. So I'll say that in our uh, analysis, we did look at um, Livingston Street, Skimmerhorse Street, State, and Atlantic, all the way from Borum Place to Third Avenue and Flatbush Avenue. Um, so when we you know make this proposal this is the these are all the intersections that we did study in our model and to keep it very conservative and kind of the worst case scenario we kept all those vehicles within the network th that we were using in our model uh, we anticipate it's more likely that vehicles will not uh, divert from you know the assigned streets that we had in our model but more likely in the larger uh, grid network uh, and more likely to change, you know, travel patterns that way um, than to get the results that well, we actually came up with. So we think that the travel time results that we are anticipating are actually a worst case uh, scenario. Um, so we are looking at all four corridors in our model. Uh, it's not just one at a time, uh, but the, the proposed treatments or improvements is correct along Livingston Street. Um, I think there was something about deliveries. Um, and so, yes, we do have, as I said, commercial loading zones that we're proposing for the north side of the curb. Um, and then, yes, if they're trying to access businesses on the south curb, they would then, you know, walk on the sidewalk and use the nearest crosswalk uh, to access those businesses. Now that'll happen. Can, can I just say one, one more thing? Yeah, one more thing, uh, Sandy, quickly. Okay. I just want to say that I don't know, I don't see what you guys are looking at because I live here and I and I walk here and I disagree with pretty much everything you said about just now. Uh, side streets, they're all backed up. They got worse uh, down in the Borum Hill section with the um, Skirmahorn redesign. The side streets are, are you know, I mean, and all along Atlantic, especially Hicks Street, um, Clinton Street, where the where the um, you know the young woman got got murdered, and I know that I mean killed. Well, you know, whatever. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, somebody was speeding, uh, and that's in the night because in the day it's so backed up the cars can't move, so they speed in the night. That's why we have. Uh, a problem with speeding uh, anyway it, it just it's a it's a mess and you know um I, I don't know i think it's a little insulting I, from where i stand it's insulting for dot to come in and talk about modeling and how this is working and that's working and um uh yeah, okay anyway. thank you thank you sandy thank you Sid. thanks Thanks for clarifying the loading on the south side of the street. I was going to ask about that. Um, I had thought at our community advisory board that DOT was going to let um, the businesses who load on the south side of the street actually use the bus lane or maybe use the striped area. I'm not sure, but it sounds like, or certain times a day, but it sounds like that I misunderstood that. Um, and there's only loading on the north side of the street. Yes, Correct. that's correct. Yeah, the bus lanes are just for buses. Okay, and, and then I wanted to understand the point of the striping, um, because my experience with striping on Kent Avenue is that cars will double park in this in the um, striped area, Ubers will um, pull in to pick up their passengers in the striped area, and it is inviting dangerous situations. Um, would you consider maybe just widening the, the, the rest of the um, components of the street and not having a striped area or putting physical bollards in the striped area to prevent 
um, placard parking, uh, Ubers, uh, loading, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I'll note that the, the striped area is roughly closer to six feet, maybe seven feet at most at some times. Um, but this allows us, um, and then we do widen the, the bus lanes a bit uh, when there is th that striped area. And then we narrow uh, the bus lanes and the travel lanes when we have these left turn bays or these um, concrete islands, whether it's the bus boarding islands or the pedestrian islands. Um, we don't think it's wide enough for a vehicle uh, to park there, but we know that um, drivers are very aggressive. And so that's why we were proposing to use these precast concrete blocks in that area uh, to discourage um, that use. Okay, thank you. And I think um, before there was kind of a uh, question about the difference between why we choose paint in some areas and concrete in others. Um, and that kind of goes to our ability to implement things uh, along the curb can sometimes be difficult with drainage concerns. Um, obviously, uh, our roadways are kind of designed for all the water to go towards the curb line. And so uh, if we were to build this out in concrete, we would also need to change some of the drainage structures in the area. And that can be a little bit difficult to do in these shorter in-house projects um, that we do. Um, so typically with curb treatments, we'll do them in paint, um, but specifically uh, when we talk about like the one at Flatbush, there's a long-term pedestrian improvement capital project um, for a few years from now to build out these painted areas in concrete uh, when they have the funds to move some of the, the drainage structures underneath the road. Are you, Chris, are you asking for a, a formal resolution from the board? Um, so this is under the uh, major transportation program or project legislation. Um, so basically, I believe you got a official email from the borough commissioner's office. And basically, I think that I think there's two weeks where the board has to respond and someone from the borough commissioner's correct office can correct me if I've got the, the, the date wrong, but there's a certain amount of time where you can officially respond um, with comments and requests. Um, so it's not necessarily that you would need to give an approval or have a vote today, um, but you have the right to, to do that. And then legally we're required to consider those, um, those uh, comments and requests. Okay, before, thank you. For implementation. So, so does someone want does someone want to make any motion about this about this? I know we did one last week, but we didn't do a motion. So I'm asking if the board wants to, if the committee wants to take a position on the Livingston Street improve, improvements. Hearing none. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to the next present uh, next presentation. Mr. Meyer, there are a couple of hands. A couple of hands. Yes, Julia. You're on mute, Julia. Sorry, I would motion to support the proposal with the um, understanding that DOT would take into consideration everything we talked about today, which I'm sure John has written up. Is there a second? Is there a second? Does anybody want to second Juliet's motion? I'll second it, Cheryl. Okay, so we have a second. We have a motion duly made to support the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, Livingston Street Transit Priority Study and Improvements. Any discussion? Well, Andy. Well, yeah. I mean, I I don't want to support it. I want to see what they're gonna come up with uh, in response to what what we said. Sid, if I could just clarify um, and to echo Mr. Franz, um, it's not really for the board to approve or disapprove. It's that we have an opportunity to comment. So uh, we could follow Juliet's suggestion to submit a letter of comment as noted, as recorded by the secretary, which could include comments both for and against. Okay. Sid, okay. it's zero. I, I, my my um my uh, electronic hand isn't working. My real hand is working. So if I could say something, I would like to add. Oh, go ahead, go ahead Sierra, say something. I, I think what Julia is getting at is interesting. I think uh, as a committee, since we can't vote yay or nay, 
I think also what Sandy is saying is interesting. I've been listening to both. Um, maybe there should be a comprehensive, a little bit more of a comprehensive uh, plan that would include maybe the adjacent Atlantic Avenue. And then in that context, so that we get a better feeling for the, the, the flow of traffic in the in this one this congested area. I don't have a motion to it. I'm just making a comment because I, I think I think it's we're only looking at two streets with buses. I think it, the idea, of course, to make buses move faster is bet is very good. But I also think the the conscientious opinions that I'm hearing is that maybe the DOT should seriously look at the little bit of a bigger picture, not the entire picture. And maybe that could be one of our suggestions. I don't know how to word it, but I think that's what Juliet, I would I would agree with something like that, what Juliet is saying. Thank you. Juliet, do you want to amend your motion? Yes, exactly. I'm happy to amend the motion to remove the support, but rather to um, frame it as a um, um, communication of all of our comments from the meeting today. Both before and um, also the. Um... Uh, that, well, well, we would want a. There is a request for a full study of Atlantic Avenue that's been made by the electeds, not just the. Uh, uh, I'm sure the DOT is eventually going to respond to that, but uh, uh, but we would like obviously to include uh, a, a more maybe a more complete study with which what what we raised, and I'm going to call on Brian. Thank you. Uh, I'm just not clear what exactly is being communicated if it's, you know, like each of the points that each of us made here today and just sending a letter communicating all those points, I'm fine with it. But like any summary of that, I feel like we should be, I'd like to know exactly what that summary will include and omit before I say I support or don't support that. As in, you know, like a, a transcript of what we talked about, you know, would be too much, but it would include it. Um, I think we should be clear on. Well, uh, I think generally we support them making changes that improve it, but the improvements have to include how it's going to impact upon Atlantic Avenue, Skirmerhorn, Livingston. I don't know if that's a complete, uh, uh, and the, you know, the, the, the questions we've raised. I mean, I'm not exactly sure how to uh, uh, do that, and I'll be happy to do whatever the committee wants. I mean, I guess I, I in a couple of occasions, I took you know minutes when um, our secretary was out, and I tend to write way overly detailed minutes that are just like a transcript and really hard to parse. Um, and I guess I'm just curious, like. I made a specific request about a block of Livingston. That seems kind of small, but if if that were like the, everything that small and above that was discussed tonight were included, I'm fine with that. Um, but if we're summarizing it, I think we need to be clear which comments are being communicated to DOT and which aren't. Well, I think we're gonna leave that up to some extent to Taya and to John. Um, Sid, can I just say one thing? Go ahead. So I just want to point out when you move more traffic to Atlantic Avenue, we have buses here too, and they are going slower because you keep diverting, because DOT keeps diverting traffic. And I don't see why we can't put in all the comments. Um, there were similar comments made by different um, committee members. Um, and I think all the comments could go in. Okay, Patrick, I'm, you're, gonna, you're gonna have the last say other than that I'm gonna move the question. <clears throat> well, I, 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 my, my read on the sentiment of the discussion is that there seem to be some unknowns or we believe that some of the outcomes of this change could be problematic. DOT itself acknowledged that it might have might be a little bit bumpy at the start. Can we make our motion to ask that DOT implement this carefully with proper support? And, to, and with the willingness to look at it with a critical eye to, you know, essentially fix it if it doesn't work or even revert? Won't do that. No? Uh, the, the, it's, it's, it's Juliet's motion. Do you want to accept that as a friendly amendment? I don't really know what that does, Patrick. I'm not really sure. 
um, that that's like precise enough. I'm sorry, I also yeah. agree with Juliet. I guess I just don't want to convey, I mean, I think there's an attempt here to essentially, you know, improve transit, improve transportation. It, we have some, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's probably not perfect. Um, and we just, we want to uh, make sure that, you know, it's, it's, it's ultimately it's carried out properly, but I, I wouldn't want to convey like an, a negative, like that we, we don't trust DOT. Okay. I think that we, We'll, Sid, I have one more question. I'm sorry to do that because my hand doesn't go up. But well, could you? I, I'm sorry, Ciro. Could you? So can is that is that of any value? That, oh, what that, I'm gonna I'm gonna what I have from is from Taya. I'm gonna because the board. This is from Taya. Because the board doesn't have a purview to pass a unified approval disapproval here, and only a letter of comment. It's our task is quite a bit simpler. Oh, and she'll work with Mr. Quint to craft a roll up of all the comments, both pro and con. And the issue of a study. That sounds good. So, Sid, should I retract my motion? Well, that's the motion. I just, yeah. I, it's just amended. I, I apologize. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Raise your hand, except for Ciro has to say aye or no. Aye. Ciro says aye. All right. So, take a second to do, define your reaction and put your hand up. Leave the hand up for a second, please. I just had a question. Are we be able to review it before it's sent? Probably no. It's a two weeks. It's two weeks to get it out. Uh, Ms. Ms. Murray, I'm willing, but it does depend on timing. I, I, I have to confirm how much time we have. All right. So, uh, Sandy, you're voting yes. If if we're gonna consider the all the comments, yes, yeah. that's what I'm voting. Oh, like. you're voting yes or no. I'm voting yes. No, you're not Nicole. <laughs> oh. um, I'm voting no just because I prefer to us to be able to sign off on it, but I agree with the spirit of it. Uh, and 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 Ciro, are you voting yes? I didn't hear you, Ciro. Yes, I am. Okay, so, yes, so, I'm yes. so, so we have everyone voting yes, except Nicole, who's voting no. Thank you. You can lower your hands. Well, John Dew, wait, wait, John Dew is on the phone, so do we have his vote? John, you still there? Mr. Dew, can you come off mute, please? We might have lost Mr. Dew. Okay. All right, we had 11 people with John Dew, so if, if it's 10 without John, then it's 910? Yes. Okay, the next thing is the presentation on the, uh, th uh, thank you, Chris, Ed and L. And- uh, Thank you, thank you everyone. Nice to see everyone. And the next thing is the pedestrian ramp review for Fulton Ferry Historic District. Hi, it's Lindsay from DDC. Hold on, let me get my, um, share my screen here. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay. John, you can put your hand there. Okay. All right. Hi, my name is Lindsay Burkhan and I am with DDC. I'm a director for infrastructure design and I'm joined here with the project engineer for the project. Um, we're here today to talk about the installation of up. Oh. Ms. Burkhan, there okay. seems to be a little bit of a delay on you. Um, my recommendation, can you turn off your face camera? That should free yeah. it up. How's it up? Oh, hold on. Okay, let's see if that's better. Is that better? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so Ramona and I are here to talk about the installation of the non-standard pedestrian ramp with granite paver crosswalks. Uh, the project is HWP 2020 LM and it's in the borough of Brooklyn. 
right, hold on, sorry. Okay, there you go. So um, our presentation is short and sweet. So we have the project location list, uh, the project objectives, the proposed treatment, the existing and proposed condition, and the project timeline. Uh, we only have one corner that has the granite paver crosswalks, which is at Elizabeth Place and Dowdy Street. I hope I said that right. Um, so the project objective is to bring this, um, well, for all of the corners within this project, but specifically this one, we are going to upgrade all of the non-standard ramps at corners specified by DOT and have them be ADA compliant. Um, at this corner, we are going to be installing the granite paver crosswalks in other ones, it's gonna be the other standard materials, which is asphalt with, um, with the paint or with the painted crosswalks. This is our proposed treatment. You can see the, um, the large granite pavers with the smaller cobblestones between. The, the smaller, granite pavers um, and, and the larger ones, they are textured so that whenever it rains, there's still some kind of surface that will pre prevent any kind of slip. All right, so on the left over here, this is the proposed treatment. There will be a header and then the um, smaller granite pavers and, or sorry, the cobbles, and then the larger granite pavers and alternating pattern for the entire width of this uh, crosswalk. And then this is our um, cross section. And it shows how the, um, the pavers are set on nine inch concrete base in order to prevent any kind of sinking of the, of the uh, cobbles or the granite pavers. So this is one of the proposed treatments. We've been using this across the citywide. Um, this one has been recently installed in Lower Manhattan at the corner of Vestry Street and Hudson Street. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it over to, oh, sorry, this is still, this is at Vestry Street. You can see how we've, um, incorporated it into the sidewalk. And I'm gonna hand it over to Ramona to, to finish up here. Hi, hi everyone. So the location of interest is uh, Elizabeth Place and Dowdy Street. So here you're seeing a existing condition. We're looking down Elizabeth Place onto Dowdy Street. And you can see the current uh, cobblestone roadway and the asphalt that's there. Uh, so next slide. And so our proposed treatment is the granite paper crosswalk. Here it's a uh, 15 feet. Um, on the right side, we're doing a curb extension um, for the accessibility. And yeah, that that's pretty much uh, it. And then so the project timeline for this project HWP 2020 LM. We're currently in final design. And we're expected to wrap up design by the end of this year. And so yeah, we're open to any questions. When will it be installed? Um, with, with final design ending at this year, uh, it should go out for a bid at the beginning of next year and then construction. So um, this project has about 38 different intersections. This is the only one that has the historic material and look. So, um, and construction for all 38 intersections is two years. So within the next, I would say, what, two, three years, it should be installed. Okay, because I think there's an issue that there's a, a flea market at that corner and the people were wondering whether it's going to impact them. And I it, um, we, we would have a community liaison who could also help, but with, um, we would take that into consideration, um, is 
we have to, is the flea market year round or is it just seasonal? It is not a decided yet. Uh, this is Katrin Adam and I don't, I don't know whether you can see me. I have this. That's right, we don't have to see you. We, we can hear you, it's fine. Okay. Um, I'm a part. Uh, I'm a board member of Fulton Ferry Landing Association, and I'm an architect. And I'm pretty. I'm very much familiar with this situation at that corner. Uh, the flea market is not in uh, started yet. It's supposed to be starting possibly this weekend. We will know how long it will last. So I don't think that it is an immediate problem. However, I have a few other questions concerning that uh, drawing which you uh, presented here, we have a catch basin right there on the corner, and that is not indicated here. And I think that needs to be, so when you, yeah, thank you for bringing up that photograph. You can see it on the left-hand side, a rather sort of dark spot, which looks like a manhole cover, which you see in the middle of the uh, block, actually, in the middle of the street. This one? Yes, but there is a cash basin over there on the corner. You see another bar, dark, move over, yeah, to the corner, a little bit further. Right here? Yeah, yes. Right, that's a huge catch basin there. Yes. So, we'll and, be that, mm -hmm. and that would have to be integrated somehow. Are you aware of that? Yes, so we are removing that basin because you can see the sidewalk, uh, there's not much room, but we'll be proposing a new catch basin to catch all the water. Where is that going to be located? Do you think? Um, it is on the northwest corner on Dowdy Street. Northwest corner. Can you go back to the oh, picture? On the other <laughs> end, so to speak. Mr. Meyer, could we maybe get through the presentation first? Oh, that was that was the whole presentation. The presentation was done, I believe. Oh, okay. yeah. Thank you. So, what we see here, this is the southwest corner, and the opposite would be the east-south corner. And what you're saying, you would move it all the way up to Old Fulton Street and have it on that point. And that is actually the same condition we have here, and it's not being addressed, which I think that it would be helpful if we could get together and kind of look at this together and see that we, as you're doing this wonderful work, which is much appreciated that it has been done so that it can really work out correctly for us because we are not only for us especially the catch basins and where they are located are extremely important because we are in a a triple a flood zone here right um so part of being ada compliant would be no ponding um Unfortunately, this slide does not show where the catch basin is being relocated to, but um, but uh, the project engineer has said that we have taken it into consideration and there will be a catch basin uh, within the vicinity and we uh, will regrade this portion in order to ensure that the water will go to the proposed catch basin. Okay, is there any way we be, can be in contact with you of, over this entire project? I think because it would make some sense to kind of, have you looked also on the other end of Elizabeth Street? I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this. I'm gonna bring in some of the other people to ask questions first and we'll get you their email address so you can communicate with them. Also. Yes, uh, Brian, you're next. Brian. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to call the the committee members first, Bill, and then I'll get to you. Yeah, of course. Um, hey, would it be possible for me to share my screen for a moment, please? Yeah. Just to go straight to the next point. Thank you. Um, so we're talking about this crosswalk right here on the north side of the street. Um, there are parking poles there, there there a light pole here parking poles here parking pole there a whole bunch of stuff here parking pole there parking pole there i think it's great to make this crossing ada compliant but none of these sidewalks are ada compliant so i'm curious i mean i wouldn't say don't do it for that reason but mm -hmm. are we gonna how is anybody who requires it going to be able to get to it 
So um, the main focus of the city right now, and this is made public um, on DOT's website, is that there have been multiple um, lawsuits against the city. And the current one is for curb ramps, ped ramps, whichever one you would like to call it. And that's to get people off of the road safely and onto the sidewalk. And it is understood that a lot of our sidewalks are also not compliant, but you have to start somewhere. And this is just where, oh, uh, you want me to start sharing my screen again? Um, and so this is just where this, this is where the city is starting. It's where most cities in the US are starting. And eventually knowing that all the sidewalks will have to be brought up to um, current ADA compliancy, but we are focusing on the curb ramps right now. Okay, thank you. Nicole? Sorry, Mr. Yeah. Meyer? Yes. Could I, could I ask a clarifying question? Ms. Burkhan, we're super familiar with the PED ramps program because we've mm -hmm. had at least three previous um, presentations on this. I, I didn't hear an answer to Mr. Howell's question, which I think was a good one. Um, why that location where the sidewalks themselves are not accessible? So right now we're only focusing on the corners themselves. Um, and it's the project that DOT gives to us. Um, the main focus is trying to get people off of the roadway and onto the sidewalk. Um, Eventually, these sidewalks will have to be brought up, but that's right now the main focus is just the the ped ramps or curb ramps, whichever one you like to call them. Nicole, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, question: Can I ask it, please? Good, good, right. thank, thank you. Sorry, Nicole. Um, the the ped ramps um, are not at the corner. Um, and uh, I'm just curious why that is. Um, there is a stop sign at the intersection because traffic comes towards it. Um, and I would imagine that vehicles coming down that way, however few they, there may be, would tend to stop at the stop sign. And that seems to be beyond where the ped ramp is located. Why not just have the ped ramp located at the corners themselves? Okay, let, I'll, um, let me get back. To, I'm gonna stop sharing my video because my computer didn't like both at the same time. So I will bring this one back up. Sorry. Um, okay. You're talking about um, this slide. Yes. Right. Um, in order to make the grading work for for um, ADA. So this one, the street has to ramp down and then you will have your ped ramp here and then it ramps kind of back up. And then same with over here, there wasn't enough room for uh, grading to be correct. Um, there just wasn't enough room. And so this was the best fit. Uh, I, think it's, it's, I think his question was why if the stop sign is there and that's where people stop as, why isn't it not at the stop sign? Well, so. So the, the stop sign will re be relocated back. Um, but due to the existing conditions and also the grading, we, it was the best fit that this was the best design to, to for the accessibility. For so the, accessibility. The answer is the stop sign will be relocated beyond this before the uh, ramps. Correct. Yes. Right. As well as the street light, I believe. Yes. Everything will be relocated in order to fit the ped ramp. Nicole. Yeah, I mean, Brian kind of got a lot of it. It's like kind of a joke <laughs> that you have a ramp that you can't get onto um, in the first place. Or if you were to get on the ramp, where are you going to go after that? Um, but I had a question about the pavers. I understand that the street is historic. Pavers are, I mean, the ones that are there now, the cobblestones, are notoriously difficult for wheelchair users to navigate on. It destroys mm -hmm. equipment, destroys wheelchairs, and destroys backs of people who are using a manual wheelchair. Can you comment on the 
accessibility yeah. level for the new pavers and if the entire street will then be redone because i mean look as long as the sidewalks are in the horrible condition they are I and mean, you can google maps like i don't know if brian pointed this out but there's like a pile of trash on the like people are going to have to use the street like if they're going to use the street at all and to get down is there any plan for the rest of the street to get repaved in pavers um and what are the um uh accessibility accommodations made for the materials being used right so all of the materials here will be smooth in order for a smooth ride for wheelchairs um and including the cobble um that's kind of an upgrade from this photo is that even the cobble that you see here will be smooth um unfortunately i have no information about when the the whole street or um or sidewalks will be will be a project um a lot of our projects, the ped ramp projects, follow the resurfacing, um, DOT's resurfacing, which would mean that we are following the fact that this, this street has just been resurfaced. Um, not so much Elizabeth Place, but um, I don't know if that answered any of your questions, but the pavers and the cobbles that we will be installing are ADA compliant and they will provide a smooth ride um, connecting, connecting the two sidewalks. Okay, well, once you're on the sidewalk, that's it. I guess people can go in circles, but accessible design is about a 360 degree look. And I guess, you know, it's a little, understandable that the city, uh, not understandable, I'm not surprised that the city kind of take an approach like, well, we were sued about this one thing, so we're gonna fix this one thing. It's the, the ramps. Meanwhile, a million ramps that you can't get onto or you can't get off of and that's it. But really consideration needs to be taken into how these cobblestones and these narrow streets just are not accessible for not just wheelchairs, strollers, walkers, blind, so many people who don't have their full abilities or need help. The street is just like a really good example of one that is what not to do and throwing on a ramp at the end of it when you can't use the rest of it does not help but i guess that's the dot patrick um i'm i'm trying to interpret the chat from bill whether or not he supports this um okay. and i would i, I would very yes. much let me finish. I would very much uh, defer to Katrin and Bill on, on this matter. However, like as Bill said, no one goes here. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't think this is really a good place to invest money. Um, I mean, I defer, though, again, to Bill or Katrin, if it's going to be used for some flea market or community use, that's wonderful. Rather, I'd, I'd rather see it just turned into a pedestrian way. Um, and leave just as is. It's quite charming. Um, but further down to the east, to the west, at the intersection of Dowdy and Columbia Heights, is a pretty dangerous intersection because the uh, the sidewalk on the south side has sort of a triangular shape to it, or or it uh, it, uh, it 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 gets it gets narrower as you go east. Um, and plus, cars are coming off Furman you know, with a fair amount of like energy and speed very often uh, at that intersection. And it's it's just kind of like a troublesome place um, and that could use some work. So that's my input. Okay, Bill, you're up. Uh, thanks, Sid. So I just want to start by saying that every photo that we've seen tonight in the, in the presentation, Brian's photos, anything that you see on Google Maps are all out of date. You know, three weeks ago, that entire lot that borders Elizabeth Place, Dowdy, and Everett Street was reconcreted, um, as, asphaltic concrete, in preparation for a flea market to, which is starting on Sunday. And, and as part of that, the sidewalk along Elizabeth Place, at least part of the of the way, has been been completely done. So every, you know, a lot of the things that you guys are talking about are, you know, they're out of date, and so 
you know, it has to be revisited, not with these out of date photos. Um, but I just want to second uh, what has been said about that particular corner. Um, Patrick is right, it's, it's very sparsely traveled and it would make more sense to be doing a project at the other end of Elizabeth Place where all the tourists coming down to the park cross. I'm talking about um, where, the, where this photo was taken from, basically, Elizabeth Place and Old Fulton Street. Um, and as Nicole said, if you're gonna be doing a repaving uh, just of a crosswalk, and not doing the, you know, re redoing the Belgian blocks on, on the entire Elizabeth Place, it doesn't make sense. These, the, the repaving of uh, Belgian blocks has been done all over Dumbo. And now you're talking about Fulton Ferry, which is just on the other side of Dumbo and just doing this piecemeal spot crosswalk rather than doing what DDC has been, done, has been doing for the past year all over Dumbo. So I don't understand it. Okay. Thank you. Do we need a motion on this? Yeah, we do. Um, just to let you know, we have to go to LPC and have them buy in on the um, on the granite crosswalk as well. So um, we do need a letter of support or a resolution. Um, yes. Well, I can tell you that I think there is some issue as to whether or not we should do anything at work on this, as opposed to either taking the street off the grid or doing the other side. Uh, Sid, may I make a comment? Who's this? Nicole. Yeah, Nicole. Yeah, I just wanted to add on, you know, access, like I mentioned, accessibility is a 360 project. It can't just be one quarter here and there or just part of the street or whatever. Whether or not DOT is ever going to get to, you know, you know, and to Bill's point, I haven't seen what the street looks like now, but whether or not the rest of the street is going to become more accessible, who knows. But that also doesn't mean that if it looks like crap now to navigate, that we can't make steps towards it. I reject this idea that, well, nobody goes there. Well, maybe nobody goes there because it's impossible to navigate and making it easier to navigate uh, will make people go there. Part of accessibility and these ADA lawsuits are that every curb cut, every street, every sidewalk needs to be fully accessible by everyone. Can't just let a few corners go just because they're not gonna be fully done at the same time or you know, fully done or because they look cute that's not what accessibility is. Okay, it's got to be for everyone. Catherine, do you want to say something before we go ahead with a motion? Uh, are you? Yeah, I, I, Katrin, on. Yes, Katrina Adam. Uh, yes, I think it is exactly as you just said. It is important that we do something because the fact is indeed that Old Fulton Street is unbelievably overcrowded, that sidewalk. And many of us who live in the neighborhood now use Doughty Street to go all the way to avoid Old Fulton Street. So there is more traffic to be had there sooner or later, especially when the flea market starts. So I think I agree that really this project needs to be looked at in total. And all the comments which were made, I think, are absolutely correct. And I agree that it's, it's a shame that we can't look at it as a total project and as it has come up just in, in the previous presentation about living with these two. Question is, Someone on the committee who wants to make a, who wants to make a motion. Is, is there a possibility that this is going to be, to be revisited with the input? No, no Catherine, I'm, 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 I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. I want someone from the committee to make a motion. I know. But Mr. Meyer, could I, could I ask for a point of clarification, please? Yes. Um, where did she go? Lindsay? Yes. Could you clarify, please, um, is the board's task to request or uh, to issue an opinion on the location of this ramp or the fabrication of this ramp? It's more the aesthetics using the granite crosswalk. Um, 
right. for the historic nature. Yes. So thanks for clarifying. So just I want to make sure that the committee, I, 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 I fully hear your concerns, Brian and Nicole, um, but just for the, the purpose of this particular discussion, um, it, th this is going to the LPC. It's not going to DOT. So the location is not really germane. It's, it's about what do you think about this faux historic paper? And Bill, you can put is this paved over now though? It's you know what what it is now, it, it's a uh, it it's it's partially uh cobblestone and the idea is they want to make it ADA compliance. So Brian, do you want to make a motion or do you have something else to say? I'd like to make a motion that we support the aesthetics of this crosswalk paver as this as uh presented by DDC. Is there a second? John Quinn seconds. Now this is only for committee members. Bill, Bill, can you please put that Bill, can you please put down your hand? Thank you. This is only for committee members. If Bill, you have to put it down again. <laughs> okay. Is there any discussion on the motion? Point of clarification again, it is just for the materials being used, but we, do we know the materials or is it like, like, what are the options? Like, no, don't use those pavers, use a different it's paver the, or? It's the pavers that they're proposing. Right. That's a, good, that's a good question. Brian will be familiar with this from land use. It's an appropriateness question is the technical term. <laughs> I, I abstain, I don't care. <laughs> no abstentions. So it's, uh, if there, there's no, yeah, John, you have a discussion? No. It's voting in, in anticipation. Yeah, of and in the hearing no further discussion, we're voting. All those in favor, raise your hands. Sandy's voting aye. Uh, I, I think we have Mr. Dew back as well. Mr. Dew, you're voting aye? Yes, I am. Okay. Zero's voting aye. So you have three three non-hand people voting aye. I'm also going to vote aye just to get it out of I don't, what, this Thank is a waste of time. Thank you. <laughs> ask for, okay, ask, put, ask put, for anybody against. Put anybody. your hands down. Anybody voting no or abstaining? We have one, no. Jonathan Rogers is voting no or abstaining. Jonathan, you're voting no or abstaining? I'm I'm abstaining. Okay, thank you. You have one abstention. So it's 10, 10, zero, one. Do I, do, I, do, I, do I have to do an action plan for this? No. You sure do. Oh, thank, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for the presentation. We, Thank you. Just for you know, uh, your own, we really would like to see the whole street done, uh, including. I understand. Unfortunately, we just work on what DOT gives us. Yes, I understand. <laughs> I may, I may, I'm, we, we may write a, we may write a note to DOT. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your time tonight. And thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Next thing on the agenda is the chairperson's report. I, I obviously that we've had another traffic death, which is really terrible. I mean, it really the traffic violence is getting just out of hand. I mean, the city zero zero vision has been a, a, a an abysmal flop. I mean, uh, and, and it's just getting it's getting worse and not better, unfortunately. Uh, and we did ask. Uh, uh, we will follow up with the plea, with the eight four and the eight eight on a, their uh, reports. I looked at them and they're they're about where they were, uh, and that's essentially my report for tonight. It's not that difficult. Is there any other committee business, John? You have something you want to bring up? Another committee business? Uh, yes, um, uh, a couple of items. Sid, I would like to pose to the committee that the city 
study the open streets, which are actually closed streets. I happen to live on an open street, Willoughby Avenue. There's no activity on the street whatsoever. The street is closed off. What happens is folks have to get out of their cars to move the, the, the gates and find parking. What is the purpose of open streets? And if that purpose is not met, the city and DOT need to return the street to its original operation. So you're asking, for, have, are you asking for Willoughby Street to be looked at or are you asking for all the open streets to look at, be looked at? I think it's, uh, this is a program that has not been validated throughout the city. Well, we've been Maybe through, some, we've been through this some, before. It's a, it's a, there's it, some it, open streets that you know, actually work for, but what is the purpose of it? The city, what has council, it the city council passed a law that said that the Department of Transportation is to implement open streets. That's the purpose of it. Now, if you want, if you want, but that doesn't mean we don't ask for anything that the city implements to study. I could go on and on about things that have been implemented that have caused, for example, the homeless population in the city is as high as ever been, and we don't look at the city policy. That's that's a land use issue by the way. But again, just because the city implements something doesn't mean that it works the way the people expect so it to work. Ask, I'm asking I am asking what that DOT study Willoughby Avenue to determine whether the purpose of the open streets is being uh, 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 realized. I'm telling you it's not. Okay. So the street is closed and it causes cars to have to drive around more and more and more. It causes more pollution. What is the benefit? So of do you want to make a specific motion? I want to make a motion that DLT study the open streets program is there to a determine is there a its second? value. Is there a second? Not hearing the motion, the motion fails. Go on to your next point, please. My next point is that Two decades ago, we upzoned downtown Brooklyn. So all of the discussion that you had today about the streets in downtown Brooklyn is a result of that upzoning and all of the additional traffic that is caused by the upzoning. We had gotten, at the time of the upzoning, some community benefits, one of which was a 400-car parking garage that was supposed to be under Duffield Street designed for placard parking. And all placard parking in downtown Brooklyn was supposed to be redirected to Duffield Street to get them off of the streets of downtown Brooklyn. That has not happened. The Duffield Street Park thing happened without the underground parking. So what are we going to do with placard parking in downtown Brooklyn? That's not been discussed. None of the community benefits that we got with the upzoning have been realized. The other one being all ADA uh, train stations. But no, and in 20 years, there's been no stations made ADA compliant downtown Brooklyn. That was part of the rezoning. Who's going to be held accountable for that? Why yeah, has that not happened? I would, talk, I would talk to your city councilman if I were you. Your city councilman if I were you. I'm, I'm actually going to be talking to the council member uh, tomorrow. Good. Let it report back. Let us know what they say. I, I certainly will do that. But why cannot community board react to it also? This is something that was approved 20 years ago as a community benefit with the rezoning, and none of it has happened. None. Okay. All right. We've also dealt with the cantilever. I'm finish up. For the committee to understand, the problems with the cantilever are caused because DLT and the city did not react. We had a plan for the cantilever that, that basically was to build on the piers 
before Brooklyn Beach Park, a, a temporary or permanent replacement for the cantilever. That did not happen. So all the problems on the cantilever, which are now resulting in impacts in downtown Brooklyn, there's no solution for that. Okay. So I'm just thank, thank, thank you, John. Anybody want to speak on community forum? Is there any non-committee members who want to speak on community forum? Can I get a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. <laughs> motion to adjourn. <laughs> All in favor, aye. Aye. Now, I won't be here next month. I will be on, on a cruise in June. Now, Emily knows about this. I hope she, she is prepared to do the next. And it may be that the next meeting have to be uh, in person. 